Complete Guide to Drawing from Life by George Bridgman, Over 1,000 Anatomical Drawings, Editor's Note. For more than 30 years thousands of art students crowded into George Bridgman's classes at the Art Students League in New York to learn at first hand the method of drawing from life which was his personal contribution to art education and which in his own lifetime had become famous. Many of the best known names in contemporary painting and sculpture and commercial art were enrolled in those classes. Bridgman's vivid and articulate personality brought lively interest to the study of anatomy. His beautiful drawings of musculature and bone structure have provided a truly new literature on the subject. These were anatomical drawings made not for the medical student or the doctor but specifically for the artist. How the body moves, bends, how its parts coordinate, how the hands clutch, pull, or push, are among the countless bodily movements he illustrated and analyzed, great artists have, in the past, illustrated the phases of anatomy that related to one or another portion of the human body. In the new complete Bridgman it is clear that all of the constructive anatomy of the human figure is gathered into one volume, Bridgman invented a terminology which graphically describes the twisting and turning of the human body. The term wedging likewise is his own, it describes how one group of muscles integrates with another. By simplifying forms and giving them increased definition, he makes his particular method an easy one to remember. In a sense these drawings of the human figure are peopled with a special kind of man, essentially Bridgman's own creation. Like the great master of the Renaissance, Michelangelo, whom Bridgman closely studied, he does not personalize or individualize, but his immense knowledge of structure is put to work. In this book one learns to foreshorten the forms and to articulate the limbs in a direct comprehensible manner because the reasons for change of form and shape are diagrammatic aligned dramatically explained. Muscles actually change and shape as they react. How they move the structure by contraction and how they appear from various points of view are explained with countless other facts in precise fashion. George Bridgman's life was devoted to making clear these complex movements of human anatomy so that artist, art student and teacher may find an inexhaustible mine of information that touches every phase of their study. The complete Bridgman is meant to be used as well as read. Nowhere can be found a more complete analysis of the hand, for instance, than in these pages. Over 200 drawings of the hand with its enormous variety of movement and position are shown. And there are explanations, as well, of its muscles at every plane. There are innumerable drawings both of structure and movement integrated with the text and a complete study of folds and draperies as they relate to the human form. In this book is the heart of Bridgman's system of constructive anatomy, his life drawing and his work on the structure of head and features. The entire work of his long lifetime in art instruction and practice is included here. It was necessary up to the present to acquire a separate book on each phase of Bridgman's art instruction. In the new complete Bridgman is presented for the first time a comprehensive volume that includes all the specialized art instruction in a form that can be readily consulted and is all inclusive. Howard Simon. This is the story of the blocked human form where the bending, twisting or turning of volume gives the sensation of movement held together by rhythm. The different stages are arranged in their sequence from how to draw the figure to the balance of light and shade. Its purpose is to awaken the sense of research and analysis of the structure hidden beneath. It is hoped that the ideas conveyed in the drawing and text of this book may enable the reader to carry on to independent and better ideas. 11. How to draw the figure. Before you make a line you must have a clear conception of what you want to draw. In your mind it is necessary to have an idea of what the figure to be drawn is doing. Study the model from different angles. Sense the nature and condition of the action, or inaction. This conception is the real beginning of your drawing. 12. Give due consideration to the placing of your drawing on the paper. For balance and arrangement, make two marks to indicate the length of the drawing. Block in with straight lines the outline of the head. Turn it carefully on the neck, marking its center by drawing a line from the Adam's apple to the pit between the collarbones. From the pit of the neck make one line giving the direction of the shoulders, keeping in mind the marking of its center, which should be the pit between the collarbones. Indicate the general direction of the body by outlining to the hip and thigh, at its outermost point, the side that carries the weight. 13. Follow this by outlining the opposite inactive side of the body, comparing the width with the head. Then, crossing again to the action side of the figure, drop a line to the foot. You now have determined the balance, or equilibrium of the figure. Carry the line of the inert side to the knee, over and upward to the middle of the figure, on the outer side, drop a line to the other foot 14, starting again with the head, and thinking of it as a cube with front, sides, top, back and base. Draw it on level with the eye, foreshortened or in perspective, outline the neck and from the pit of the neck draw a line down the center of the chest, at a right angle to this line, where stomach and chest join. Draw another line and then draw lines to indicate the rib cage as a block, twisted, tilted or straight, according to its position. Now draw the thigh and the leg which support the greatest part of the weight of the body, making the thigh round, the knee square, the calf of the leg triangular and the ankle square. Then draw the arms, 15, these few simple lines place the figure. They give its general proportions, indicating its active and inactive sides, its balance, unity and rhythm, bear in mind that the head, chest and pelvis are the three large masses of the body. They are in themselves immovable. Think of them as blocks having four sides, and as such they may be symmetrically placed and balanced, one directly above the other. In this case, the figure would have no movement. But when these masses bend backward, forward, turn or twist, the shifting of them gives action to the figure, whatever positions these three masses may assume, no matter how violently they may be drawn together on one side. There is a corresponding gentleness of line on the opposing, inert side and a subtle, elusive, living harmony flowing through the whole, which is the rhythm of the figure. 16. Proportions of the human figure. All measurements of the human figure are divisions of the body into parts of given measurements. There are many conceptions of measuring, scientific and ideal, and they all differ. If given proportions were used, even though these proportions were the ideal average, they would result in a drawing without character. Again, to apply these so-called canons of art, 
The figure must be on the eye level, upright and rigid. The least bending of the head or body which adjives the given proportions visually, though not actually, 17. Male from an anatomical point of view, taking the skull as a unit, horizontally, the bone of the upper arm, the humerus, is about one and one half heads in length. The bone on the thumb side of the forearm, the radius, is about one head in length. The forearm bone, the ulna, or the little finger side, measures about one foot from elbow to wrist. The thigh bone, or femur, measures about two heads, and the leg bone, or tibia, nearly one and one half heads. The illustrations show three different methods of measurement, one by Dr. Paul Richer, one by Dr. William Rimmer and one by Michelangelo, 18, Michelangelo, eight heads. Measurements, you have to measure, first of all, with your eye, and by studying the model judge the comparative measurements of its several masses, then measure mechanically. When measuring mechanically, hold your charcoal or pencil between the thumb and fingers and use the first finger in the tip of your charcoal to mark the extremities of the measurement you are taking. Your arm should be extended to its full length and your head so, tilted that your eye is as near as possible to the shoulder of the arm you are using in measuring, from the model. The space registered from the first finger to the end of your charcoal or pencil may be one inch, but on your drawing this measurement may possibly be two or more inches. In other words, all your measurements are comparative and if the head space is seven times into the length of the figure and registers, say, one inch on your charcoal or pencil. Obviously the height of seven heads should be marked off on your drawing regardless of the size of your drawing, which size you had, in a general way, predetermined and may be anywhere from miniature to mural. The arm has its axis at its connection with the shoulder blade. The eye, being above the arm and more forward, has an entirely different axis and radius, arms and necks vary in length. Also, in measuring, as in target practice, it is natural for some to close the left eye, others the right, and still others to keep both eyes open. So, with these varying conditions it is difficult to set down any fixed rules for the technique of measuring. Your own physique and tendency to use one or both eyes are such important factors. In any case, however, you must keep your eye as close as possible to the shoulder, your arm extended and stiff, on a figure, there are no marks that may be used in proving your measurements correct. Again, the model may be far above the level of the eye, causing violent perspective. Only at the eye level can the pencil be held perpendicularly. Above or below the eye level, the pencil or charcoal must take some studied and given angle, and to determine this angle accurately requires some practice. To find this angle, take a paneled wall or a vertical pole and upon it mark off six or seven spaces a foot or so apart. Then seat yourself several feet away and at arm's length, with eye close to shoulder, inclined charcoal or pencil to register correctly each of the spaces you have marked off. As in revolver practice, you will become extremely accurate in judging the angle at which the charcoal should be held, at different distances. This same method of angles may then be applied to measuring the figure, 21. 22 measurements, movable masses, head 8 inches high IV 2 inches deep 6 inches wide, cage, 12 inches high 8 inches deep 10 inches wide, pelvis, 8 inches high 6 inches deep 10 inches wide, 23, 24, the upper and lower limbs are held in place on the cage and pelvis by mortise and tenon, called ball and socket joint and at elbow and knee by the jingling or saw hinge joint. The surrounding muscles, by their position, shape and size are capable of moving these joints in any manner that the construction of the joints permits. As movement occurs, and the body instinctively assumes a position suited to the taking of some action, the muscles, by contraction, produce the twisting and bending of the masses. In so doing the muscles themselves expand, shorten and bulge, making smaller wedges or varied forms connecting the larger and more solid masses. This shortening and bulging of the muscles becomes an assemblage of parts that pass into, over and around one another, folding in and spreading out. It is these parts passing into or over each other that gives the sense of wedging or interlocking. This might be compared to the folds in drapery, where the folds change, their outline changes. 25, 27, a form either passes around or enters into the outline of the visible boundary of a figure. It should be an indication of what it really is, the outline of a form. Within this outline, for the same reason, forms pass into and over other forms. They wedge, mortise and interlock. The outline of a figure may be so drawn that it gives no sense of the manifold smaller forms of which it is composed. Again, the outline of a figure may be so drawn that the sense of the figure's depth, of the wedging, interlocking and passing of smaller forms within the larger masses conveys to the mind an impression of volume and solidity. 29. Balance. When several objects are balanced at different angles, one above the other, they have a common center of gravity. In a drawing there must be a sense of security, of balance between the opposite or counteracting forces, regardless of where the center line may fall. This is true no matter what the posture may be. A standing figure whether thrown backward or forward, or to one side or the other, is star shionary or static. The center of gravity, from the pit of the neck, passes through the supporting foot or feet, or between the feet when they are supporting the weight equally, in a way, the pendulum of a clock when hanging straight, or perpendicular, represents a standing figure without movement. It is static, stopped, so is the clock, but start the pendulum swinging. It describes an arc, moving back and forth, but always about a fixed center of gravity. The position of the pendulum when at one or the other extreme of its swing or arc, from its center of gravity, represents the extent to which a figure may be thrown out of balance. And this position would also represent the 33 greatest rapidity of motion in the drawing of a figure in action. Yet even in the most extreme motion there must be a sense of security, a feeling that the figure, like the pendulum, could come back to a fixed center of gravity. This feeling or sense of balance which must be recorded in the flow or sweep of a drawing is continuity and rhythm, 34, 36. Rhythm, the consciousness or idea of rhythm cannot be traced to any period, or to any artist or group of artists. 
We know that in 1349 a group of Florentine artists formed a society for the study of the chemistry of colors, the mathematics of composition, etc., and that among these studies was the science of motion. But rhythm was not invented. It has been the measured motion of the universe since the beginning of time. There is rhythm in the movement of the sea and tides, stars and planets, trees and grasses, clouds and thistle down. It is a part of all animal and plant life. It is the movement of uttered words, expressed in their accented and unaccented syllables, and in the grouping and pauses of speech. Both poetry and music are the embodiment, inappropriate rhythmical sound, of beautiful thought, imagination or emo. 37. Tion. Without rhythm there could be no poetry or music. In drawing and painting there is rhythm in outline, color, light and shade. The continuous slow motion picture has given us a new appreciation of rhythm in all visible movement. In pictures of pole vault or steeplechase we actually may follow with the eye the movement of every muscle and note its harmonious relation to the entire action of the man or horse. 38. So to express rhythm in drawing a figure we have in the balance of masses a subordination of the passive or inactive side to the more forceful and angular side in action, keeping constantly in mind the hidden, subtle flow of symmetry throughout, 39, 40, rhythm. 41, turning or twisting, in a human figure there are the masses of head, chest and pelvis. Each of these has a certain height, breadth and thickness. Considered as blocks, these masses balance, tilt and twist, held together in their different movements by the spinal column. As they twist and turn, the spaces between them become long, short or spiral. We might liken these movements in the spaces between the masses or blocks, to an accordion when it is being played. Here we have an angular, virile, active side, the result of forcing the ends or forms towards each other and by this action compressing and bringing together on the active side, the pleats of the accordion. The two opposite or inflated side describing gentle, inert curves, the blocks or masses of the body are levers, moved by muscles, tendons and ligaments. The muscles are paired, one pulling against the other. Like two men using a cross-cut saw, the pulling muscle is swollen and taut, its companion is flabby and inert. When two or more forms such as the chest and the pelvis are drawn violently together, with cords and muscles tense on the active side, the inert, passive mass opposite must follow. There is always to be considered this affinity of angular and curved, objective and subjective, active and passive muscles. Their association is an EV table in every living thing. Between them, in the twistings and bendings of the body there is a harmony of movement, a subtle continuity of form, ever-changing and elusive. That is the very essence of motion, 43, 44, 45. 47, light and shade. Shade with the idea that light and shade are the outline you have drawn in giving the impression of solidity, breadth and depth. Keep before you the conception of a solid body of four sides composed of a few great masses. And avoid all elaborate and unnecessary tones which take away from the thought that the masses or planes on the sides must appear to be on the sides while those on the front must appear to be on the front of the body. No two tones of equal size or intensity should appear directly above one another or side by side, their arrangement should be shifting and alternate. 48. There should be a decided difference between the tones. The number of tones should be as few as possible. Avoid all elaborate or unnecessary tones and do not make four tones or values where only three are needed. It is important to keep in mind the big, simple masses and to keep your shading simple, for shading does not make a drawing. 49, 53, distribution of the masses, it is not granted many of us to remember complex forms. So in considering the human figure it is better, at first, to think only of those major forms of which it is composed, and these may be thought of and more easily remembered by a simple formula such as the following. Considering the wedging and passing of forms from the front of the figure, the square ankle passes into the triangular calf of the leg and this in turn passes into the square knee. The square knee passes into the round thigh and the round thigh into the mass of the hips, from the sides of which a triangular wedge enters the rib cage. The rib cage is oval below, but approaches a square across the shoulders. Into this square enters the column of the neck which is capped by the head. The head when compared with the form of the neck, is square, square, round, square. Dart round, square, square. Distribution of the masses, considering the wedging and passing of forms from the rear of the figure, the head is square capping the round neck. The rib cage is square at the shoulders, wedging into the neck, and triangular below, wedging into square hips. The square hips rest on the round pillars of the thighs. The knees are 56. Building the figure, from a piece of lath and a few inches of copper or other flexible wire, a working model of the solid portions of the body may be constructed. Cut three pieces from the lath to represent the three solid masses of the body, the head, chest and hips. Approximately, the proportions of the three blocks, reduced from the skeleton, 57, 58. Drive two parallel holes perpendicularly through the center of the thickness of each of these blocks, as closely together as practicable. Wire the blocks together by running a strand of flexible wire through each of these holes, allowing about half an inch between the blocks, and twist the wires. Together, the wire in a rough way represents the spine or backbone. The spine is composed of a chain of firm, flexible joints, discs of bone, with a shock absorbing cartilages between them. There are 24 bones in the spine, each bending a little to give the required flexibility to the body, but turning, and twisting mostly in the free spaces between the head and chest, and between the chest and hips. The spine is the bond of union between the different parts of the body. The portion of this wire between the head and chest blocks represents the neck. On the neck the head has the power to bend backward and forward, upward and downward, and to turn. The head rests upon the uppermost vertebra of the spine, to which it is united by a hinged joint. Upon this joint. 59. It moves backward and forward as far as the muscles and ligaments permit. The bone beneath this hinged joint has a projection or point resembling a tooth. This centers a socket or hole in the bone above, and forms a pivot or axle upon which the upper bone and the head, which it supports, turn, so, when we nod, 
we use the hinged joint, and when we turn our heads, we use the pivot or axle. The wire between the two lower blocks represents that portion of the spine which connects the cage or chest above with the basin or pelvis below. This portion of the spine is called the lumbar region. It rests upon the pelvis or basin into which it is mortised. Its form is semicircular, concave from the front. On this portion of the spine, the lumbar, depends the rotary movement between the hips and the torso. As the spine passes upward, becoming part of the cage or chest, the ribs are joined to it. 60. The masses of head, chest and pelvis, represented by the three blocks, are in themselves unmoving. Think of these blocks in their relation to each other and forget, at first, any connecting portions other than the slender wire of the spine. In the little tin soldier at attention we have an example of the symmetrical balance of these blocks one directly over the other. But this balance never exists when the body is in action, seldom, indeed, when it is in repose. The blocks in their relation to each other are limited to the three possible, planes of movement. They may bend forward and back in the sagittal plane, twist in the horizontal plane or tilt in the transverse plane. As a rule, all three movements are present and they may be closely approximated by turning and twisting the three blocks in the little model of lath and wire. The limitation to the movement of the spine limits the movements of the three masses or blocks. Such movement as the spine allows the muscles also allow. 61. Moldings. Architectural moldings consist of alternate rounds and hollows, of plain or curved surfaces, placed one beneath the other to give various decorative effects by means of light and shade. The human figure, whether standing erect or bent, is composed of a few big, simple masses that in outline are not unlike the astragal, og, and apophagy moldings used in architecture. Looking at the back of the figure, there is the concave sweep of the mass from head to neck, then an outward sweep to the shoulders, a double curve from ribcage to pelvis, ending abruptly where the thigh begins. A slight undulation halfway down to the knee, a flattened surface where it enters the back of the knee, another outward sweep over the calf and down to the heel, the whole, a series of undulating, varied forms. And the front of the figure curves in and out in much, the same manner, a series of concave and convex curves, and planes. The distribution of light and shade brings out these forms, 62. The human head at first the study of heads should be in the abstract, that is, we should, forget everything that distinguishes one head from another and think of the masses common to all heads. Heads are about the same size. Each is architecturally conceived, constructed and balanced, each is a monumental, structure, by first mentally conceiving of a head as a cube, rather than as an oval or egg-shaped form, we are able to make simple, definite calculations. The cube of the head measures about 6 inches wide, 8 inches high, and 7 and a half inches from front to back. These measurements are obtained by squaring a skull on its six sides, face, back, two sides or cheeks, top and base or lower border, which is partly hidden by the neck but is exposed under the chin and jaw, and again at the back where it is seen as the lower border of the skull. Therefore the base of this cube is about 7 and a half inches deep and 6 inches wide, and on this ground plan is on that of a square. Any form may be constructed, this cube may be tilted to any angle, also foreshortened, and it may be placed in perspective, the skull, the skeleton of the head, like the cube, has six surfaces, top, base, two sides or cheeks, front and back. Its bony framework is immovable, except the lower jaw, which articulates, there are 22 bones in the head. Eight of these bones compose the brain case and 14 bones compose the face. The brain case is bounded in front by the frontal bone or forehead, which extends from the root of the nose to the crown of the head and laterally to the sides of the temples. The two malar bones, or cheek bones, are facial bones, each united to four other bones forming a part of the zygomatic arch which spans the space from cheek to ear. Above, the malar or cheek bone joins the forehead at its outer angle, below, it joins the superior maxillary or upper jaw bones. The two superior maxillary bones constitute the upper jaw and cylinder that hold the upper row of teeth. They are attached above to the cheek bones and eye cavities. The nasal bones form the bridge of the nose, 68, 1 frontal 2 temporal, 3 zygomatic arch, 4 malar, 5 superior maxillary, 6 inferior maxillary, 7 nasal, the inferior maxillary or lower jawbone is the lower border of the face. It is shaped like a horseshoe, its extremities ascending to fit into the temporal portion of the ear. It is a mandible, working on the principle of a hinge moving down or up as the mouth opens or closes, but with a certain amount, of play, sideways and forward, so that when worked by the masseter muscles the food is not simply hammered or flattened, but ground by the molar or grinding teeth. The masseter muscle extends from under the span of the zygomatic arch to the lower edge and ascending angle of the lower jaw. It is the large muscle raising the lower jaw, used in mastication. It fills out the side of the face, marking the plane which extends from the cheekbone to the angle of the jaw. 1 temporal 2 masseter, v, muscles of mastication, 1 temporal, 2 masseter, 3 buccinator, cheek muscle, 4 and 5 lesser and greater zygomaticus muscles of expression, top view occipital, frontal frontal, cheekbone. Eminences, ridges and depressions of the skull, occipital, drawing the head, begin by drawing with straight lines the general outline of the head, then draw the general direction of the neck from its center, just above the Adam's apple, to the pit, at the junction of the collarbones. Now outline the neck, comparing its width and length with the head. Draw a straight line through the length of the face, passing it through the root of the nose, which is between the eyes, and through the base of the nose where the nose centers in the upper lip. Draw another line from the base of the ear at a right angle to the one you have just drawn, on the line passing through the center of the face, measure off the position of the eyes, mouth and chin. A line drawn through these will parallel a line drawn from ear to ear, intersecting, at right angles, the line drawn through the vertical center of the face, 74, with straight lines, draw the boundaries of the forehead, its top and sides, and the upper border of the eye sockets. Then draw a line from each cheekbone at its widest part, 
to the chin, on the corresponding side, at its highest and widest part. If the head you are drawing is on a level with your eyes, the lines you have just drawn will intersect at right angles at the base of the nose and if both ears are visible in a line from the ear extended across the head, it will touch the base of both ears. Consider the head as a cube, the ears opposite each other on its sides or cheeks in a line from ear to ear as a spit or skewer running through rather than around the head. If the head is above the eye level, or tilted backward, the base of the nose will be above this line from ear to ear. Or should the head be below the eye level or tilted forward, the base of the nose will be below the line from ear to ear. In either case, the head will be foreshortened upward or downward as the case may be and the greater the distance the head is above or below the eye level the greater the distance between the line from ear to ear and the base of the nose. You now have the boundaries of the face and the front plane of the cube. The features may now be drawn in, perspective of the head. Perspective refers to the effect of distance upon the appearance of objects and planes. There are to be considered parallel perspective, angular perspective and oblique perspective. Parallel lines which do not retreat do not appear to converge. Retreating lines, whether they are above or below the eye, take a direction toward the level of the eye and meet at a point. This point is called the center of vision, and it is also the vanishing point in parallel perspective. In parallel perspective, all proportions, measurements and locations are made on the plane that faces you. So in drawing a square, a cube or a head, draw the nearest side first, 76, when an object is turned to right or left, so that the lines do not run to the center of vision. Then the center of vision is not their vanishing point and the object is said to be in angular perspective. When an object, such as a cube, is tilted or turned from the horizontal it is said to be in the oblique perspective. Take a circle for an illustration. Draw a horizontal line through its center, then a line at right angles. Where they intersect place a point of sight. Should a head be placed directly in the center of this circle the center of the face would correspond to the root of the nose, on a line level with the lower border of the eyes. The horizontal line is called the horizon and is at eye level at the height of the eye. The features will parallel the horizontal line, 77, if the head remains in the same position and the observer steps to one side. The side of the head comes within the range of vision and the relative positions of the head and features are perspectively changed, but not the proportions. The distance away is the same, looking directly toward the corner of a head at close range. It would be necessary to change the point of sight. The lines that were parallel with the horizon are no longer parallel, but drop or rise to meet the horizon at some point to form vanishing points. Unless a head is at eye level it must necessarily be in perspective. When a head is above the spectator, obviously he is looking up. Not only is the head in perspective, but every feature of the face, eyes, nose, mouth, ears. Like the barnacles on the hull of a ship, the features follow the lift. In the same manner they follow the upward trend, or its reverse. Everything to that is secondary. The features must travel with the mass of the head, perspective must have some concrete shape, for more mass as a basis. A cube or a head seen directly in front will be bordered by parallel lines, two vertical and two horizontal. These lines do not retreat, and therefore, in appearance remain parallel. As soon however, as they are placed so that they are seen from beneath, on top or from either side, they appear to converge. This convergence causes the further side of the object to appear, smaller than the nearer side. The rules are, first, retreating lines whether above or below the eye tend toward the level of the eye, second, parallel retreating lines meet at the level of the eye. The point where parallel retreating lines meet is called the vanishing point. As objects retire or recede they appear smaller. It is the first rule of perspective, on this, the science of perspective is built, 79, distribution of masses of the head, four distinct forms compose the masses of the face. They are, 1, the forehead, square and passing into the cranium at the top, 2, the cheekbone region which is flat, 3, an erect, cylindrical form on which are placed the base of the nose and the mouth, 4, the triangular form of the lower jaw, 81, from forehead to chin a face that is not flat either protrudes or recedes, curving outward or inward, alternating as to curves and squares of varied forms. In this respect a face in profile resembles architectural mouldings. 82. Construction of the head. First draw an outline of the head, then check to see that it will take but four lines. Number one line is to be drawn first, number two line next, three and four to follow numerically. Number one line is drawn down the face touching the root and base of the nose. Number two line from the base of the ear at a right angle to number one, with no relation to the face as to where this line crosses. Number 3 line is drawn from the cheekbone at its greatest width to the outer border of the chin. Where 2 and 3 intersect, start the 4th line and carry it to the base of the nose. Whether the head is seen from above or below, the features will follow the number 4 line, planes of the head. I am considering the distribution of the masses of the head, the thought of the masses must come first, that of planes, second. Planes are the front, top and sides of the masses. It is the placing and locking of these planes or forms that gives solidity and structural symmetry to the face, and it is their relative proportion as well as the degree to which each tilts forward or backward, protrudes or recedes. That makes the more obvious differences in faces. 86. Heads in general should be neither too round nor too square. All heads, round or oval or square, would be without contrast in form. In drawing, one must look for or suspect that there is more than is casually seen. The difference in drawing is in what you sense, not what you see. There is other than that which lies on the surface. The front of a face is the front plane. The ear side is another plane. Spectacles are hinged to conform to. The front and sides of a face, the square or triangular forehead must have a front and two sides. Magine three planes. The face turns at a line from each cheekbone downward to the outer side of the chin. There is also a triangular plane on each side of the nose. Its base from tip to wings forms another triangular plane. There is also the square or rounded chin with planes running back from each side. Border lines separate the front and sides of the forehead above, and cheekbones and chin below. 
across from ear to cheekbone is a ridge separating two more planes which slope upward toward the forehead and downward to the chin, considering the masses of the head, the thought of the masses comes first, then the planes. After that the rounded parts of the head. There are four rounded forms on the skull. One on the forehead, two on the sides of the head, just above each ear, and one on the front of the face, extending from nose to chin. On each side, at the upper part of the forehead, are two rounded elevations termed the frontal eminences. These eminences often merge into one and are referred to as the frontal eminence. 89. The plane of the forehead slopes upward and backward to become the cranium, and the sides turn sharply to the plane of the temples, the plane of the face, divided by the nose, is broken on each side by a line from the outer corner of the cheekbone to the center of the upper lip, making two smaller planes, the outer of these turns to become the plane of the jaw, which also is again divided by a line marking the edge of the massy to muscle, running from the outer border of the cheekbone to the corner of the jaw, and again making two secondary planes, one toward the cheek and one toward the ear. The relations of these masses and planes is to the molding of a head what architecture is to a house. They vary in proportion with each individual, and must be carefully compared with a mental standard. 91. The head in profile. In profile the masses of the head are the same, the cranium, the skeleton of the face, and the jaw, the front border of the temple is seen to be a long curve, almost parallel to the curve of the cranium. The top of the cheekbone is seen to be prolonged backward toward the ear as a ridge, zygoma or yoke, which also marks the base of the temple. It slopes slightly down in front. From cheekbone and zygoma, where they meet, a lesser ridge is seen rising between the temple and the orbit, marking the back of the orbit and the first part of the long line of, the temple. Assume a profile view of a head measures 8 by 8 inches. Directly in front or from the back, the relative proportions would be 6 by 8. At 3 quarters view it would be somewhere between the two measurements, 93. Above eye level, when a cube is tilted upward in such a way that the spectator is seeing it from beneath, it is above the horizon or height of the eye. If more of one side of the cube is seen than the other, the broader side will be less in perspective than the narrower side. The narrowest side of a cube presents the more acute angle and will have its vanishing point nearest, when an object is above eye level. The lines of perspective are coming down to the level of the eye and the vanishing points will be near or far apart according to the angles. The nearer the object the nearer together are the vanishing points. When a head is to be drawn in profile it is well to first determine whether the head is above or below eye level. This can be done by holding a pencil or rule at arm's length at a right angle to the face from the base of the ear. If the base of the nose shows below the ruler, then you are looking up underneath the head, therefore the head is above eye level or tilted backward. If the head is three quarters view or front, the line from ear to ear will cut below the nose is in profile when seen from beneath. 94. In looking down on an object you will see more or less the top of the object. If the object is a head, you will see the top of the head. The higher above the head you are, the more top you see, the lower you are, the less you see, the top is nearest the level of the eye and the lower part further away. In profile at eye level the center of an adult's head will be a little below where the hook of a pair of spectacles curl around the top of the ears. If this line were continuous, it would pass through the eye, dividing the head into two parts. The base of the ear is on a level with the base of the nose. A line passing around the head from ear to ear would parallel the spectacles, when the view is below eye level you are looking down and therefore see a portion of the top. This means the head, top. Bot tom and sides are rising to the level of the eye. From the lower corners of the forehead, the cheekbones mark the beginning of a plane descending downward in a long curve to the widest part of the chin. This curve marks the corner of the two great planes of the face, front and side. Here the spectacles turn in perspective as well as the line passing from ear to ear, 96 below eye level, round forms of tf one head, the skull is rounded on both sides of the head directly on a line above the two ears. Part of this formation is the parietal bone, a thick spongy shock absorber at the side of the head, at its widest and most exposed portion. Below this, cylindrical in shape comes the rounded portion of the face. This rounded portion corresponds to the lower portion of the face in as much as it has front and receding sides. The upper portion, known as the superior maxillary, is irregular in shape and descends from the base of the eye socket to the mouth. The lower portion, known as the lower or inferior maxillary, takes the same curve as the mouth and is part of the angular jawbone. The nose lies on the center of this cylindrical formation, below the nose. The lips follow the contour of this part of the rounded form, which as a covering, takes the shape of the teeth. It is in reality, plane against plane, adjusted at different angles, which forms the shape of the head. There is no exact mathematical proportion, but in perspective or from any angle, we are forced to balance truly one side with the other. 98. Round and square forms of the head. A square line naturally is the outline of a square form. A round line is the outline of a round form. The classic beauty of all drawing is a happy combination or contrast of both these forms. A partially rounded square form or a partially square rounded form adjacent to each other do not produce power or style. 100. When a head is built on a cube there is a sense of mass, a basis of measurement and comparison. The eye has a fixed point upon which to rest. A vertical line divides the head into two parts. These are equal, opposite, and balanced. Each side is an exact duplicate of the other. A horizontal line drawn through the lower eyelids divides the head in half. The lower portion again divided in the middle gives the base of the nose. The mouth is placed two-thirds up from the chin. Built on the form of a cube, the head has a sense of bulk and solidity that easily lends itself to foreshortening and perspective. 102. Oval construction. When heads are built on an oval, the basic idea is that the shape is rather like an egg. The main line passes through the features from top of head to chin. This is divided into three parts. The cranium and forehead of the adult occupy the top half. The lower half divided again in the middle gives the base of the nose. The mouth is placed two-thirds the distance up from chin to nose. When the head is tilted or turned, the main axis that is drawn down the face follows the oval. 
The divisions follow the divisions as before mentioned. In the oval construction the iron deer are taken as the medium line. Above this line is the top of the head, while below is the face. A line drawn at a right angle to the line already drawn, gives another median or facial line. On this the features are marked off to give their relative positions. The car ridge of the head rests upon its placing or poise upon the neck. When the head tips or leans forward, back or toward the sides, the head and neck must be in relation one to the other both in movement and rhythm, the head in light and shade. There is light and shade on any objects on which light falls. There are light, shade, and cast shadows. The light blends into half-light which again blends into a half-tone, which again blends into a shadow. A cast shadow is the shadow of some object falling on some other object or form and bears a resemblance to the object from which it is cast. In the parlance of art the variations of light and shade are in a sense numbered, catalogued and called values. Light, half-tone and shade, making three values, are said to be all that one can keep track of. The grading, passing, and mingling of these, through or into one another, gives the suggestion of other values, but they become more subtle and less definable. There are many methods, mannerisms and approaches to handling light and shade. One is that form is built by light and shade, that the outline does not exist, the edges of the object are given prominence by light and shade. Another approach is that an outline drawing is solidified by light and shade, that the outline itself should suggest depth, volume and bulk with only enough shade to give it solidity. Values are comparative and depend upon their surroundings 106. The masses of the head are represented by planes. When the head is turned, the divisions of planes are the same, however turned, the masses of the head remain the same. Planes are front top and sides, 107, no near tones, of equal size or intensity, have your conception. O for solid body, a decided difference, between the light and shade, 109 comparative measurements, in an adult, from the extreme top to the bottom, the eyes, roughly speak, ang, are in the middle. The head and face of an infant may be divided in three parts, the eyes placed on the line marking the upper third, from the chin up. In all heads the base of the nose is placed halfway between the eyes and chin, the mouth two-thirds the distance from chin to nose. Ages between these two necessarily range somewhere between. There is also a marked difference in the formation of the head with varying ages. The forehead of an adult recedes, the cheekbones become more prominent, the jawbone more angular, the whole head in fact more square. In infancy the head is more elongated and somewhat oval in form. The forehead is full, it recedes down and back toward the brows, the jaw bones and other bones of the face are diminutive, the neck is small compared to the head, in youth the face is lengthened and is less round than in the infant. The head above the brows however, is not enlarged in proportion to the increase of the lower part of the face, the child's head, the cranium of a child's head differs from an adult in shape, solely as a means of protection. The head is of an elongated and oval form, its greatest length being in the direction from forehead to the back of the head, its widest portion lies just above the ears. The forehead is full, 